Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, what have you been up to? What have what you guys been up to? What have we been up that to? That has been good. Um, I have been frantically um, trying to finish. So there's a sociology book I wrote in 2016 called Belonging Again, and it sat right over there for like, and then I'll pick it up every few months and work on it and like revise things um, involving thinkers like Peter Berger, James Hunter, and a lot of sociologists that I think are really, really important to the conversation today that I actually think have basically forgotten and dropped that offer a kind of tragic vision of how society operates, like a continual trade-offs of um, uh, givens and releases. I think the triumph of, of the therapeutic by Philip Reef is particularly good on this topic. And so now I'm just basically forcing myself to finish it before I turn 35 on the last day of this month. So uh, it's like, it's like, it's just like an arbitrary deadline where I'm like, I'm going to freaking finish it, dang it. Because uh, I really think it's important. And um, uh, the, the entire topic, because like, like, for example, when you talk about meaning, like one of the things that sociologists like, um, like Reef and then will point out, it's like, well, one of the issues is you always got to remember in classical religions, it wasn't simply that they made everything meaningful. They also made everything alive in a kind of risky sense. Like there's this living God and there's like angels and demons. And so risk is really important to feeling like your life has meaning. Like if you do, for example, um, like there are lots of people in uh, church, like, you know, we always have to remember when on these online communities, we talk about like the death of religion or religion after a religion or religion e equals MC squared, that millions of people still do, do go actually to churches, rather it be Islam, Hindu, Christianity, like they're still quite populated. But those people in those practices don't necessarily have meaning. There are lots of people who regularly attend church that actually feel nihilism and all of the different things because you can enter a kind of robotic religious practice that lacks life, right? And so one of the reasons that's really important for things to be enchanted, like, um, and Philip Reef was an atheist. I mean, he's not, but he's examining a lot of the religious um, religi religions. And he's saying, you know, in these religions, God is alive. God is mysterious. God may send you on a quest. God may tell you to have kids. God may tell you to sacrifice your son like Abraham. Like there's this risk. It's not merely enchantment that is part of reality, but risk that is part of reality. Um, and risk, we always got to remember like in kind of capitalism, it's kind of funny because there's a lot of talk about like entrepreneurship risk, but really it's a very risk averse culture. Like you got to be like risk is careless. You know, you do your nine to five, you do something that's pretty safe and whatever. And yeah, if you can get um, uh, venture capitalist funding, then you can do your risk. But it's actually kind of become, even the entrepreneur path has kind of become a, a track now. Like you go to the Harvard Business School to start your business. So it's not the same thing. But it's really important that risk is danger, but also value creation, also unknown. And that that is a really important um, dimension to uh to thinking about when we talk about meaning and i think that's where um like when ebert will say like uh the, the meaning of life is courage there does seem to be something about courage that is really important there does seem to be something yeah there is clearly victor frankel's uh, man search for meaning talks about meaning as important but it seems like there's also a few fundamental things that need to be taken into account all at the same time basically and i and, and what i find very interesting is this notion of not mere, and then I'll pass it to whoever wants to speak, not merely meaning being everywhere and part of reality, but risk being part of reality. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, when Ebert talks about the meaning of life is courage, it just reminds me of Heidegger talking about the, the meaning of life is care. And that, to me, it's having the choice to care uh, about something and taking that risk and caring about certain things and not other things. Um, and realizing that you're always concealed from the things that you're not concerned with and realizing how in every choice there's that risk in that respect. Um, and then uh, what you also said made me think about uh, faith where, when it becomes robotic, cause I was actually thinking about this the other day, just thinking about like Spinoza where he, talks about faith in an interesting way where it constantly you're constantly choosing to have faith and in that sense it's a it's a constant choice and if you're not mm. constantly choosing it it becomes kind of robotic and in that sense it's not really even faith anymore so i feel like the whole notion of faith is contingent off of the risk element that um you're talking about but yeah yeah i feel like what you just boiled down i haven't read spinoza but that feels essential and rich that faith is something that's actively renewed almost like an active 
participation, a participatory orientation to life. And uh, a lot of what you said was resonating with me, uh, Daniel. I definitely feel like I'm in some sort of um, initiatory process of that nature right now in which in so far as like I, I have this experience of my wishes and my will I'm continually rubbing up against failure and it's almost like the reality that the universe is designing for me is forcing me into the choice to surrender because there are things that I want that I have no idea how to get to them. And if I try and think my way to them, it is frankly impossible. And and this creates a kind of perfect condition for me to be forced into, I don't know if forced is the correct word, but I'm I'm presented with this place in which surrender feels like the the optimal grip and the way through. And then... From that place, first and foremost, there's a lot of relief, but then there's also more creative flow and there's a, a readiness to take risk. And I'm really interested in this, uh, this edginess of the riskiness of faith and what it might, the sense of that it might impel you to do something seems to be kind of part of the deal when it comes to spirit or Holy Spirit in the Christian context. And I'm sure there's other mappings for a similar thing but that sense of the risk of of letting it flow through you feels very alive for me right now mm. um and you know in the midst of challenging times to then shift into creativity and to shift into uh participating and expressing i've just started recording my first solo video for like the last six months today and getting back in front of the camera and like it's kind of like doing a cold water plunge where if you you can kind of like train the muscle for it and then if you leave it for a long time you just kind of develop this you know i don't want to use the any swear words on the channel but you, you develop this uh less than masculine orientation to, to doing it and it becomes quite challenging so cutting through cutting through that and uh yeah kind of a, a messy expression here but there's some confluence between um surrender and creativity and risk and the last thing i'll throw in is a, a thought that came to me before this conversation that the tyranny and authoritarian threat that has most presented itself to us in recent years comes under the guise of safety and it's for our safety and protection that we're you know, getting beaten by police in parks and, you know, kind of uh, prevented from from the possibility of free action. So sa safety becomes the, the, the voice of authoritarianism. Well, that was magnificent. Um, you know, I, there's that phrase, a few times, there's that phrase, better safe than sorry. But very often being safe is to be sorry. Like that's an example. Like that's a phrase that I always, there's so many phrases that kind of do our thinking for us that we don't even realize do our thinking for us. Like no one wants to, of course, like meaninglessly put themselves in danger. And like, you know, there's something to be said about safety, but it's almost interesting. It's, um, I guess, you know, I've been thinking a lot about overfitting, underfitting versus right and wrong. Whereas like, you know, there's something about safety that you, you want, but then we tend to overfit it as a kind of mono value. Like it, it can be the, the supreme value and then it actually becomes a tyranny. And that's one of the great insights, of course, of Hegel is that something that's overfit then becomes tyrannical actually. But then of course it's not self-evident how it fits. Like, so this is why you have to have this active thinking, like every situation you have to like actively think about the balance between say, um, safety and, and, and then avoiding and, and the safety and then risk that you need to take. So your life feels worth living. Dang it. Uh, like there's, it's, it's, we often don't connect safety and nihilism, but actually safety can lead to nihilism. Like if you constantly feel safe and like you're never taking risk, what does that lead to? Boredom. And then what is boredom? Boredom is not a state where you have nothing to do. It's a state where you don't see significance of what you could do. So there's a deep connection between a safe society and a nihilistic society. 
But then there's also a deep connection between a society that constantly feels at war, conflict, and is never safe in nihilism because you're always never able to do anything, right? So this is what's so, like, it seems to me the one of the great rubs is that there's a ditch on either side of the road. Like I see that, you know, I say that phrase all the time. Like there's a form of safety where if safety is overfit, there's totalitarianism and nihilism. But then there's a form where if there's not enough safety, you have nihilism because there's violence and nothing works, right? And you, there's a ditch on either side of the road. And so, and that seems to be the case with every single value. There's too much freedom, too little freedom. Too much justice, too little justice. You know, too much justice is when basically the state controls everyone's action to make sure there's no injustice. But then if you have too much freedom, it's anarchism, no one can relate. And it's like, uh, it's just an endless repetition of the revenge cycles in the Icelandic literature or different things like that, right? So I think it's so important, like today, because I know there's, um, you know, obviously there's conversations in like integral, spiral, meta mentality, and I know that's a whole meta modernism, and that's a whole nother topic. But when, I, but to me, like when there's a lot of talk about this oscillation between modernity, post-modernity, oscillation between different values. Like, I almost prefer the language of thinking of it as walking a narrow way between two ditches, right? Like, there's a ditch of too much post-modernity, there's a ditch of too much modernity, right? Whereas I, I almost feel like the language of oscillation makes it feel like you move between autonomous values back and forth, when really it's almost like moving between them. Now, that's a metaphoric critique. That's not a hard critique. That's just a language critique. I'm not going after the system, but it's like, like, it's that ability to kind of navigate how to balance those things that seems so important that is more like, to me, I, I'd, I'd be curious what you think, to me, it's more like a navigation than an oscillation. Does that make sense? That's just kind of, of a, a metaphoric critique. And I, and I don't even like calling it a critique because that sounds harsh, but it's like a navigation versus an oscillation. Yeah, that, what you're talking about uh, reminds me of, I'm reading Owen Barfield right now. Hmm. And uh, he wrote this really, uh, I haven't finished it yet, but it's so good. It's like in my top five all-time books, and it's only wow. 80 pages. It's like really, really good. Um, it's called Speaker's Meaning. And he makes a really interesting point about language having two primary components where it's expression and communication, and that the expression kind of takes into the takes into account the what, while the communication takes into account the how. And when a language has too much communication, it's, it creates certainty, like math, where it can actually like hit at like the, the, the direct points where the poet is more in tune with the expression aspect of language, where there isn't certainty. It's not clear on what it's being communicated, but you know it's an expression you know it's expressing some kind of, uh, you know, emotion, some existential state. Um, and it just made me think, because, like, I, I've, I've spoken with Daniel about just, like, this concept of a new language or just another type of, like, model to, like, kind of conform to our to current English, just having a... Uh, certain words within a sentence that indicates like more of the expressive aspects of language while having within the same sentence certain words that express more of the communicative aspects of the language um, if that makes any sense so I just I just think uh, what you're saying about navigating uh, just reminded me of just how language navigates between this certainty in communication and this abstraction and, and expression. I just wanted to say, it seems to me that the, well, if you don't have the, that communicative graspable language, then you're just going to be sort of all over the place, mm -hmm. but it's through the poetic language that you're able to convey multiple levels at the same time of reality. They're kind of scaling up and down. Um, and I find the most interesting, compelling thinkers, philosophers uh, that I've been drawn to are ones whose kind of philosophy is intoned into the language. People like Terence McKenna and Alan Watts and more contemporaneously like Jordan Hall, all kind of interesting weirdos in their own right. Uh, I say that in a, you know, adoration, um, but 
when you really listen like underneath the language it feels like the rhythm of it and the uh, uh the, the shape of the language is almost conveying as much as the, the content um but i wanted to just throw a quick question to you daniel about what you're saying about that i love this ditch on both sides of the road thing and it makes sense to me that you could have uh you know too much too little safety too much too, too little freedom but i wonder um what if we put something like love or spirit or faith and how would you respond to that like can is it too much or too little love spirit or faith like oh no that, 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 you know that is an outstanding question i uh, very very well put and um uh, mr luber that's a fascinating sounding book i really like this idea of languages communication versus languages expression and it makes me think where so much of the game today seems to be like uh, being able to do language like the expert poet. And what I mean by that is like, if I think of someone like, a, you know, I always go to Wallace Stevens because I think he's like a super genius. Like his, his poem about a snowman, I think communicates very well. Like it's very clear what's going on in the poem. And yet there's 50 layers going on. It's one of the most profound poems ever written. And so he somehow in like a very linear communication is also expressing. And it's almost like today, it, it's like the ability of the expert poet is what is needed, right? And I, I guess you could say, well, what about the expert technician? Obviously, that has a role in some of the technological forms, but it almost seems like for human coordination, because I've been thinking about a, lo a lot about the human coordination problem versus the technological coordination problem and different things like that. It almost seems like today, if you grant me the term metamodernity, which I know is a difficult term because it means something very different in cultural studies versus what it means in the liminal web. And I think that's led to a lot of problems. Um, and then people are also using metamodern to refer to post postmodernity. So it's like a time phrase. Now, technically, you're not really supposed to name an age something new unless the structure of the society has changed. And that's kind of an important point. Like you would say, we're in postmodernity because the structure of the society, not the cultural notions, but the structure of the economy, the politics and different things of postmodernity is different from modernity. And arguably, you haven't had a structural change from postmodernity to refer to metamodernity in that same way. Now, that gets into the nitty gritty of cultural... Uh, you know, cultural studies and different things. But that's one of the reasons why I think the term metamodernity is actually very difficult to use. It's because you almost have it in those three senses and following different people at different times, it can be used in one of them and not the other. So there's a lot of confusion. But if you grant me metamodernity as referring to our current age, which some, again, some cultural studies would not agree with, um, then it would seem like the name of the game for humans is a kind of expertise poetic language, which finds that Wallace Stevens communication and expressionalism, which is insanely difficult. I will also note before getting to Jacob's questions, when I say that the language of oscillation may communicate something different from navigation, I do not mean to say that people in the sphere of uh, metamodern liminal web would disagree with my point. They would all say, well, that's what we mean by oscillation is navigation, right? The problem is, is that language communicates certain things, even if it is not meant to communicate certain things. And so that's what I'm saying about kind of a, a metaphor critique. But to what you're saying, um, on the notion of can you have too much faith? Can you have too much love? Can you have too much of different things? Um, certainly from a practical standpoint, you can have such thing as too much love because you cannot extend the same amount of love to say your immediate family or your, uh, like every person on planet earth. Like if you literally tried to love equally your family, your friends and strangers and everyone you met, you would literally be, um, you would be washed out. You would have a, uh, you would uh, burn out. Is is the phrase I'm looking to, right? Also, there's an argument to be made that simply by trying to focus on everyone in that same way, there's a kind of inflationing and cheapening that can occur, correct? Now, one should always be open to the possibility of loving a stranger in the same way that they say love uh, their friends, but also there's a certain, there's also different kinds of love, right? Like mm -hmm. there's the particular unique love of the spouse, there's the particular unique love of the friend. There's the particular unique love of the people you work with, right? Like at work, right? All of those aren't exactly the same. And that's where like C.S. Lewis has his great book on the four loves. You have the, the philo, the friends of the, the, uh, the, the love of friends. You have the, the eros, which is love of spy and I can keep going, right? Now, what's interesting is basically he'll kind of argue that when you disorder the loves, you get a tyranny, right? Like when you try to love your wife, like according to Philippi, as opposed to Eros, that actually destroys the relationship, right? So there's a question of like, I don't think you should never be 
turned off to the possibility of extending love. So that's where it's like kind of more all the time. But there is something to be said about rightly ordering certain kinds of love and limiting those loves precisely so that they maintain their meaning. Right. And the same can occur when you start talking about like faith. Right. <clears throat> so like if your faith, if your faith in God is equal in character to your faith in your boss to pay you next Friday, that would be a disordering kind of faith. You're not supposed to treat uh, all things with the same kind of faith. Right. However, there's also distinctions between like faith, trust, hope. And you have to go through usually what ends up happening is the limitation of faith is precisely necessary to make space for the next value that is similar to that, but also kind of different, right? And if you don't limit it, then they all blur together and they actually lose character, right? In the same way that if words come to mean like too many things at the same time, words lose their meaning. Like if, mm. if like, for example, if the word azure and serline and navy all just mean blue, well, then you lose something because actually serline is the blue sky. Navy is a dark blue. Azure is like that robin egg blue. And then blue is a general category, right? But gradually, people start just using serline as a interchangeably with Azura and interchangeably with blue, right? Well, something is lost, actually. Like we actually, li like the, if, if the limits of my language are the limits of my world, then the expressions of my language are likewise the expressions of my world. And if I actually lose the language through blurring to express the unique shade of serline blue, then I actually lose kind of a conceptual category to even experience that difference. I don't see it as well. Uh, I don't experience it in the world as well. So there's a way in which limitation in the way that I am describing is precisely for the sake of refined definition and refined experience that actually then is a good thing. So it's limitation in the, for the sake of order, right? And that order then actually creates greater beauty in the same way that like there's an ordering of the lines in a Wallace Stevens poem. There's the ordering of the images in a painting and the colors precisely to make the harmonious whole. So the limitation is for the sake of a harmony. And then the harmony itself of the values is kind of unlimited in a way, right? Because it is precisely the true infinity of which changes the way that we relate to the whole. So funny enough, when you, this is kind of the point Lewis also makes, when you limit arrows per, to just your spouse and you limit filii just to your friends, the arrows actually makes the filii stronger and the filii makes the arrows stronger. By keeping them in their right domain, you then carry, but you then go between those domains in a fuller way, right? So then you do, they do actually feed into one another as if they're all part of the same entity. And again, the example I always go to is, of course, the Trinity, right? You have difference, and yet it's all the same. Three persons, one essence. So when you rightly limit all the values, they then actually come to share the same essence. And thus, in a funny way, they're always in play at all times and all the other values, precisely because of the limitation that rightly orders them. In the same way that wherever there is the Son, there is also the Holy Spirit and the Father, precisely because there's a distinction in the persons. Uh, and so that is how you get this interesting way of limiting actually being expansive because it makes possible the harmony that makes them always at play in all the other values. Luber, I love you. Have a good one. Best of luck, you know, best of luck with the script on the transcendence and Hegel and absolute knowing. You're going to do really well. Thanks, Daniel. So, so I have to go, but I'm genuinely curious about uh, what I just uh, messaged in the group, but I, I do got to go. Sorry, guys. Beautiful. See you, Mr. Luber. And Chita, okay. good to see you, sir. Yes. So uh, I think uh, the, the two sides to that. One is this discussion of, you know, limitation of values. And I've been trying to think, to think about this, uh, you know, uh, question in some way. Uh, I think I think this, this question of limitation actually is a question of quantity and quality in some sense. You know, at what point, you know, um, uh, you know, quality of something changes when, it, you know, when the, when the quantity starts shifting in that sense. And I think I think the challenge uh, usually becomes that um, that limitation as it happens can be can be a great thing, you know, uh, in, in that sense. But when we try and limit something, when we when we intentionally try and limit things around us, when we when we try and calculate it in in, in that sense, uh, we also change its nature. So. Uh, on one side, we want our love to be a certain certain kind with our wife and certain kind with our children, certain kind. 
but if you start calculating it if you think uh, you can calculate it and can create that love you you imme- immediately in some senses corrupt its um, um character also so then the, i think then the, i think the challenge challenge becomes uh, uh, how do we find a relationship with uh, uh, a certain kind of a you know object around us which can, it can be love it can be uh, you know without actually corrupting its uh, you know value for us mm-hmm. how can we create for the value from it rather than simply um, keep on you know reproducing its it, it, it's a lot of people actually try and do that a lot of people try and find uh, manage these relationships through very calculated uh, uh, you know or, ordering mechanisms and what happens usually is that even though the form start, remains the same or form remains intact to large large degrees its content completely gets dried out from it within in, in, in those relationships you know you know those relationships are functioning in uh, you know, i think that's that's one point i i, I wanted to sort of say something the risk society also uh, the question of risk in that sense also which um, you know i think jacob had you know, brought in a brilliant point it's linked to authoritarianism and i was thinking what hana arendt immediately when she when he was talking about so in hana arendt uh, this question of risk is extremely interesting because she is arguing that that to enter into the public sphere unlike the social uh, you need to you need to be able to risk your life but counterintuitively public sphere is also a sphere where that risk is not mediated simply through violence in fact public sphere violence is completely meaningless over there you have to negotiate the public sphere through language you know you will not you have to reason with the other person that's what public sphere is so there is a form of risk that comes out which is not mediated through simply violence and which is very interesting that what does it mean to take a risk in a in a conversation where i have to convince you and you have to convince me it's not the same risk which will be when we are when we are going for a, going to fight for a war when we have to go and attack each other when we have to go and fight for enter the physical battle with each other those two risks i think uh, need to be thought of i'm not saying they completely separate they they are you know meeting points but but i think this this kind of a risk of this nature needs to be i think further explored with you know i i, I i'm not sure how you how you would think about it well i'll just comment um that's really nice like thinking through different categories of risk i really like that um it's kind of like when sartre makes the point that if you were like imprisoned you'd still be free because you could control like uh your consent to it so he's trying to prove free will precisely in imprisonment right and like right there kind of suggests there's different kinds of freedom right there's some sort of internal freedom and then there's an external freedom right well likewise there seems to be a like a bodily risk of going to war but then a kind of social risk mental risk uh interpersonal risk like if i you know the moment you enter a conversation i right now could say you're an idiot and like force you to go through life carrying that thought right there is a risk because you never know what someone is going to say right and so and sometimes if somebody says you're an idiot you almost would have rather been punched in the face because if you get punched in the face within 12 hours it feels you know maybe in 20 minutes it feels better right but like if i call you an idiot you can like carry that around for weeks and it can color all of your experiences so it's not even clear what risk is worse you know it seems to like mix right like getting your arm cut off seems worse than being called an idiot but being punched in the face maybe not right and it's very interesting to think through those different kinds of risks i but but there, so there was a few things um one i really like what you're saying also about bringing together this question of limit into the realm of quantity and quality that's a nice connection and also i completely agree that there's this really weird thing where if you calculate the difference the difference doesn't work and yet there is difference so where does the difference come from It seems like the difference has to emerge. Uh like it has to emerge through experience and then you know what it makes me think of this really really important line that Jacob had at the start where he you were talking about how like you don't know like you're doing things you don't know how things are going to go, right? Like you don't like there's a faith in that, right? There's something there that I think is a big deal. Like so if we're talking about meaning, which again I know we've kind of like again there's a problem of language because when you call it the meaning crisis that might suggest that the primary thing you need to do is get meaning when meaning might be incidental to taking risk or facing fears, right? Now are we really but then of course, 
you know, the, the phrase, the meaning crisis has been one that has resonated with millions of people. So do we really want, and that there's a benefit to that because then that starts a conversation that otherwise would not have started. So it's always very interesting, these dilemmas between starting a conversation, but picking the nuanced, precise phrase. But if you pick the nuanced, precise phrase, it's probably something complex that nobody can resonate with. And so it doesn't catch fire, right? So we always have to be sympathetic to those, those different things. But what's interesting is I find that like in my own life, meaning comes precisely from doing a thing that you don't know how it's going to go like precisely that unknown is the realm of meaning and so then there's kind of an irony where like if you prioritize like if you do this practice or thing you'll get meaning well then you kind of know the outcome and does that work against the meaning i don't know i don't want to say those practices are bad because they clearly can help people like come to a certain attunement that maybe makes them face a fear so I could see how like it, it works in that way. And maybe like you overcome some sort of trauma because you go through these different practices like Viveki and different things will do. And that's really beneficial because otherwise you wouldn't step into the realm of doing a thing that you don't know how it's going to end up. So I can see how it goes. But it seems like they have to go together. Like the practices ultimately have to be in the service of a willingness to do a thing that you don't know how it's going to end up. Right. And that's what's so mm -hmm interesting it has to be that like the practices have to ultimately lead to stepping into a realm that you don't know how it's going to end up and this is what's weird precisely because you don't know how it's going to end up there's meaning and it's almost like if you knew it's kind of like we've talked before how Blondell makes this brilliant point where he says hey guess what the brain tends to think for certainty and as soon as it gets a sense of certainty it doesn't care anymore like, it doesn't care anymore. Like, once you know the doorknob's a doorknob, you don't care that it's a doorknob. You only tend to think about things that you don't know. And yet the point of thinking is to know. So if thinking gets its goal, it kills itself in a weird way, right? Likewise, meaning seems to come from, like, not knowing what the thing is, which you would think meaning would have to come from knowing what the thing is. Because how can you have meaning from a thing that you don't know what it is? And yet mm. it seems to work that way in this really wild way. And so it's really important to see that kind of paradox, which then, of course, for me, would align with an ontology of AB and all, and all that fun stuff. Uh, but there's this way in which, like, you have to step into a realm where you don't know how things are going to work out. So the ergo, they're not calculatable. And yet you are, in a way, calculating how you're taking steps in that direction in today, even though you don't know the outcome. So it's like the calculation has to be reserved for the now, to yourself, not over others. Because that's the other mistake. It seems to be like we use calculation to control people as opposed to using calculation if I or thinking to use that language on how we can maintain ourselves to keep the courage to keep walking toward this thing that we don't know what it's going to be, right? And so it's like we have to reverse all those things. Um, and then I'll pass it to whoever wants to speak. And so it also seems to be like when you enter into love relationships, you can't be calculating how they're going to be different. You're, you can't calculate the unique ways in which they have character. And yet you have to walk into them also open to the emergence of the distinctions of which make them work in harmony with one another. And then acknowledging those things when they arise and then like more phenomenologically, but not calculating them ahead of time. This is what is so strange because it's almost like you get it until you talk about it. Like you get how Eros and Philip Philos and um, there's other ones um, and there you get how they're different until you think about it. And then you don't know how they're different. Right. <laughs> like there's a weird way in which you go, oh, well, you know, your spouse is the person you live with. And you say, well, can't you live with friends? Right. You're like, oh, well, the spouse is the one you have children with. Well, aren't there like people that adopt children that aren't married? You can keep playing this game, right? And then it's like, how do you define it? And yet, you know, from a certain kind of apprehension that there's a different quality that cannot be calculated. Very strange stuff. But I think uh, kind of, and then I'll give it to you once to speak. There's something about this nessus, this, you, you, you don't know what it is, and yet you're doing it. That seems to be the realm of what the meaning, the meaning stuff. Uh, but, but anyway. So... I think one of, one of the interesting questions here actually comes with, you know, uh, I remember an Indian philosopher asking this. I can't remember the person's name. I think the ancient philosopher who asked this question that, you know, how do we, how do you know what you're feeling? It is that feeling in that sense. You know, how do you know you're feeling love or you're feeling hate or you're feeling, because each, each of our feelings actually, uh, uh, you know, can have other feelings within them in, in, in that sense. 
and how do we identify for instance i can be feeling intense hate i reflect upon and realize that hate was coming from a lot of love it, it can vice versa i can be showing a lot of love and you can you can immediately understand it's coming from intense hate and no um so on so forth so how do we recognize what are we feeling in, in, in that sense how do how do we how do we find that uh, you no know, point of naming something identifying it within ourselves and i i think it it becomes a, a question of that nature which is why i i you know one has to start thinking about this question not not simply through uh, uh, as you said you know rightly said it's not a point of success where you you can calculate that this is what i want to achieve in fact its nature comes from its own failure and it's that failure that helps you uh, you know uh, identify it and work with it work through it so it's not like i i can immediately say oh i feel a lot of love i can say through ritualistic form of thinking which was i have already done that work before at some point but to really say that i love this thing i need to feel the experience of failure of that emotion itself to be able to identify it in, in that sense to be able to name it to be able to you know capture it in some kind of kind uh, of some kind of language and if you can't experience this failure if you if you can't if you if you really you know experience only its success if you if you don't have the this element involved into it as you, as you were saying you know then you you not be able to you'll not even know what your emotion is you you'll, you'll be in in the end fooling yourself and you know creating some kind of narrative for yourself and so on and so forth there is something very interesting about uh, this kind of a uh, phenomenon in, in in that matter uh, and i think just to add to this uh, discussion what what the other thing is that that if if this question of limiting it quant- quantitatively uh, calculating it doesn't work then how do you affirm the difference you know you think it then what is it about this affirmation of difference that can't simply function through either the quantity or the quality realm also even preserving its quality have ha- the same kind of effect so it's not like quantity doesn't work quality works even that's not true quality has a similar problem built into it then how do you how how, how do you how, how do you affirm difference in that sense when you, when we name you know things like you know even even in hegel is absolute knowledge and so on and so forth then what is what is the way for the affirmation of the gap in, in in that sense how do you find that subject at the point of the gap itself you know what is what is that pure split that that becomes possible in in, in that sense which i think ebert was talking last time in our you know discussion mm. and how do you find the subject the point of unconscious you know that's what i think he was trying to get us to think about it Yeah. yeah so many uh so many lively threads here and i've been dropping in and out on my internet <laughs> i'm trying to like hold the the dialogos that's happening whilst i'm dropping in and out um but uh it it seems to me that there's something something coming through here that the that the risk that the risk is somehow fundamentally important to the distinction of the value or the like the value of faith or the value of love can only be known by the possibility of its absence and that's what gives it quality if i was in faith all of the time then faith wouldn't have the quality that faith does and that's why you know the 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 figure of jesus is doubt is so important theologically um but i think this is there's an even more like meta and not like abstract meta but like very much here meta instantiation of this which is that my most optimal participation in this dialogue that can give rise to dialogos is through being in the state of the possibility of risk of speech itself being a kind of risk and and that there and the excitement that gives the possibility of it being a worthwhile activity um but also it's about the way that i'm holding my own awareness and thought which is there was a certain point where uh chitan was introducing this idea that the there are these distinctions of values but if we articulate them then it's kind of lost somehow like i know that these relationships are different but i hold it at this level of ambiguity it's not grasped in my consciousness and it's the exact same thing with this dialogue and it was at that moment in the dialogue that i realized there's so many threads moving here that if i actually try to grasp them it's going to be uh it's suboptimal to the binding of them together so really i'm just staying with it and being faithful to 
staying with that present moment with you all such that when the moment comes to take the risk of speaking, then something lively can happen. But I, I, I really, uh, it doesn't work well if I try and like think about what it is and then grasp it and then hold it and then like lose, lose the combination of the ambiguity, the presence and the edge of the moment. That that is a magnificent phenomenological reflection, and a you know there's a few. Things. I think it is so um like in these conversations, like the mode of like letting it wash over you and not trying to hold the threads. Strangely enough, allows like something to emerge, which is so weird. Like there there's something here on the failure, the letting it be. Like Heidegger talks about clearing, like Luba was pointing to, that is precisely like optimal. The same when I would do like wrestling. Like when I really thought really hard about the move I was gonna do, I really sucked. Uh, but if I just went because it almost became bodily and kinetic and I just let the moves and the knowledge of the moves wash over, it just happens. The same goes with like playing piano. Like when I'm doing like improvs or whatever, like if I go, what am I doing next? It fails. And yet I do know what I'm doing next, right? Like what's going on? Like you, you, like you do know you're going to say something and yet you don't. This is what's very strange. And this almost suggests a major problem with talking about anything. Because the moment you talk about anything, you almost imply more intention that is actual that is actually present for the optimal. Like whenever you talk about something, it presents it in a kind of linearity or a non-paradox or a straightforwardness that doesn't actually describe the quality of the experience, right? And, and the very navigation of that space is inherently risky. Like that's why it seems like risk is so fundamental here. I don't know what it... I'm always hesitant to say it is most fundamental. That seems to be the, it almost seems like whatever the most fundamental thing is, it's a collection of things. Like it's not meaning, but it's also not just courage because you can be courageous as you storm the Capitol on January 6th, right? You know, it doesn't seem to be just goodness because goodness is defined within an ideological structure. But then do you really want the most fundamental thing without goodness? That seems pretty bad, right? So whatever the most fundamental absolute X variable, capital X variable is, if there's such a thing, it seems to be a conglomerate of different things. It seems closer to the whole human subject. Like, that's why I always find interesting, like, you know, again, I just referenced, like, where if the meaning of life is a person in Christianity, or in Hegel, if the absolute is actively participating with the subject, like, it seems actually closer to that. Um, but this paradoxical thing, like, it, 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 it's almost like to on what you're pointing out. So anyway, this notion, and Javier has mentioned this before as he walks in, is this kind of washing over is optimal and not trying to grasp. Like very often, like for me, the structure of the net is intentionally kind of risky. You have no idea who you're gonna see. You really don't know what you're gonna talk about is gonna happen. And that's kind of the fun is like learning to have a kind of habit of risk taking in conversation, right? And that actually seems to be optimal um, and to kind of work and to train you to kind of enter into that space and to have that kind of washing. Um, and there's something about life in general that's optimal that way. And the last thing I'm gonna say, and I'm gonna pass to what I wanna say, and Michelle's on, so she'll tell you this. It's actually funny you bring this up about identity, like identifying through failure, because randomly I'll have a paper writing session that involves going to the garage at 9.30 at night where there's no internet and writing something out. And the thing that I was writing out is was on this kind of question of like certainty and how we like know, for example, that the cup on the table is a cup on the table. And like, can you ever be sure? And that's kind of a classical Kantian simulation question. And the thing I was kind of talking about, it's like your, 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 your sense that the cup is there is based on the fact that the table is always holding up. And it's like the entire scene is together, not just the cup. When you ask questions about just the cup, you get in trouble. You have to ask questions about the relations that are in play in the entire scene. So it's more holistic than singular. So the fundamental is the scene. But the other key point is you tend to know that the cup is a cup because you know what it's like when a cup breaks. You can't put water in it anymore. It shatters on the floor. And then from experiences of a broken cup, you extend those to experiences of a working cup and gain from that confidence that the cup is in fact a cup, right? And so when you ask like a lot of the analytical tradition questions of how do you know the thing is a thing, well, in that moment in space when it's working, it's really hard to say. But when you think about it in the context of times when it broke, it becomes much easier. 
Likewise, if you're trying to prove free will and you remember what it's like to be forced to do something you don't want to do, it becomes much easier to believe in free will because you know what it's like to be asked to go to the movies when you don't want to go to the movies, right? But if you separate the question from the failures, it becomes harder to identify, right? So the failures have a way of bringing things together. And the other thing is I wonder, and then I'll pass to who wants to speak, is it precisely the failure of a clear distinction in quality that then forces the individual to make a risky choice to say, yes, I believe that this love with my spouse is different from friends, even if I cannot locate that difference in quality and quantification. And I'm going to take the real choice and risk of saying there is a distinction here because I believe there's a distinction, even if I cannot prove it. And that is precisely what then makes the meaning is the risk of kind of taking a radical absolute choice, a kind of radical choice that is located simply in something that you cannot name, that fully feels apathetic, that then is the meaning giving character of it. The choice, the kind of absolute choice, as I like to call it, of a kind of otherness, of a kind of distinction, of a kind of be that you yourself are locating in the world even though you cannot locate it in the world. Is that the inherent risk act, the inherent apathetic act, that is necessary for meaning. Uh, I wonder this. Oh, well, I was just going to say the feeling of relationality that you speak to and the kind of Trinitarian way of thinking about reality as, as kind of fundamental. And that seems to be true of this reality as, as much as anything. And it seems like there's a something imbued in what you're saying about the risk of relationship, not only that kind of drawing down from the apathetic, drawing down from the unnamed, the undistinguished into the distinguished and like Adam naming the animals in the God and the, the, the power of the logos of doing that. When you do that, you are also gifting or affording something because it's relational um particularly between people that when you do that for your spouse when you know your spouse that's kind of really essential to what love loving relationship is really with i guess any kind of loving relationship there's something about the you knowing that person in the mystery of their being and that what that means is you are pulling in something that's not distinguished and you're daring to distinguish it and it's a gift <laughs> no uh, I, I don't know i don't know about your culture but in india we have these expansive rituals about naming so if you mm. keep a name of a young boy there will be great many rituals for instance in my case you would go to a gurdwara which is you know the sick uh, they would find the word like you know would be a word and they would tell you that this is the word you want to write a name from and so on and so forth. In India, almost all of us are named in some senses, you know, in a, in a ritualistic manner. It's not like anybody will just keep a name. You have a horoscope, the horoscope will tell you this word represents this person, so on and so forth, you know. So, uh, uh, we don't, I think, realize this, but there's something extremely claustrophobic about naming. You know, uh, in some senses, uh, naming can be, uh, I think, I think, I think this link between language and violence, this question of symbolic violence, as we, uh, we think about it, really is rooted into that when we name something, we reduce it to that name. We reduce, we, we try and sort of, you know, plunge out other qualities or other things from that, which is why, you know, sometimes when you're feeling something and somebody says, what do you, what are you feeling? And you're not really sure. If you if you really just name it at that moment, your feeling vanishes. You 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 repressed it just by naming it, just by, and you tell the person, no, give me some time, I will process it, and then you know. But but there is there is another form of naming that emerges precisely at that point of gap when you can't name it. So there there is always a name that emerges, which is not really simply reducing it to its its minimal. Uh, qualities, but rather it's a form of name that is simply holding itself such that the whole soul phenomenon doesn't get reduced to its minimal level. You know, and that kind of naming also happens at times when you are when you are when you are when you give name to something just so you have a placeholder over there, just so the gap doesn't vanish. 
just so the gap remains visible to you in some ways you know and those kind of meaning mechanisms also exist in the human uh, i think what we are i think discussing is this problem of philosophy of naming something mm. you know and 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 there there is always a risk when you name something in that sense, when you identify something when you when you you know give it put it in language when you are able to um, and I, i think you know that there goes that um, that kind of uh, thinking in that sense. That is so beautifully put, Chitan. Um, I just want to add on the sense that there's, there's something in the way the naming is held, right? So uh, as a parent, you might name the child, you, you endow them with the name, but it would be possible also for the parent to hold the naming of the child in such a way that, you know, this uh, child is called, you know, uh, David, right? But when you look upon David as the parent, you kind of see the mourners. And you don't... I know precisely what he is. I know the fullness of his potential. So it's not the naming as such, but the the way that the naming is held. And 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 just you know as equally and kind of to 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 me- mess up the waters here as well like even with like a negative naming for example you're talking about the the violence right if you know the violence of the social sphere if everybody calls you a scoundrel or a thief or a plagiarist or something like that can be at just as damaging and exclusionary as if you did get pushed out into the woods but you might call somebody a scoundrel in a way that you know is kind of not reducing them to that and it could even be flattering or complimentary okay, so this is fascinating um Titan, that was magnificent and what you just said jacob was magnificent okay so if naming has a kind of violence to it so to your point jacob if i were to name my kid hitler it would be totally arbitrary and yet we all know it's not arbitrary like literally their life will suck because of it and yet and so it matters And yet it's arbitrary. So this is really weird, right? Like there's also something about naming here. Like we know name, like when you name a child, this is a really great way to frame this, okay? When you name a child, there is a sense in which it's arbitrary and you're ultimately like, I don't know, John, I don't know, whatever. And yet it does have causal impact on their life. Like it can, it can matter. They start to identify with it. They start to see themselves as John. They start to say, oh, me and this guy named John have a connection because we have the same. So there's a causal impact on their life by the name. So naming is weirdly arbitrary. It's weirdly in a vacuum where it's like, there's not really like, there is a reason you go with name, but it's more, it's really hard to explain why you decided to name them John. And yet it does matter, right? That you make this choice. And this is a choice that stays, it tends to stay very, very few people will receive a name and later in life change it, like officially, like go change the documents, right? It tends to be like a real choice, like an absolute choice in a way to use that different language. And so, but there's a violence there as well. You're kind of forcing them to go by the name John. And yet if they didn't have a name, people would struggle to talk to them. People would struggle to relate to them. And they may even struggle to relate to themselves, right? So not giving them a name seems problematic, but also giving them a name seems um, consequential. Uh, Chitan, thank you for being here. So, so, so likewise, if we talk about like deciding, I'm going to believe that there's a different character between my love of my spouse and my love of my friends, even though I can't even identifying it, that choice does matter it does change how you behave and how you act in the world. And yet there's a violence in that because you're cutting off possibility. And yet that very violence creates possibility that otherwise wouldn't occur. So now I'm thinking about like, is so meaning, does meaning require violence? You know, there's a sense in which meaning requires violence in the way that we are describing. So what is the difference between mm. sacred violence mm. and bad violence? Because this is also what's really weird. Like basically all the religion, like it's hard to find a religion that doesn't have violence in it. Why? Like that's really strange. It's as if they all kind of understand there's some inevitability of violence, but there's a difference between sacred violence and just like killing violence or something. It makes me think of the difference between like hunting and sacrifice. Now, uh, you know, I guess I'm channeling Gerard now. So like when you go out and hunt an animal and let's say recreational hunting, 
where you're not even going to eat the food. It's just in America and it's hunting season and you're going to hunt animals, right? That seems different than, say, sacrificing an animal on an altar to forgive you of your sins or something like that, right? So both of them are violence, but there's a difference in character of the violence that is very consequential. So there's a kind of naming as violence that is just kind of recreational, arbitrary. Yeah, it's John, who, who knows, right? It's just kind of arbitrary. But then there's another violence that is like, this is Hitler. That's like, it is a sacred violence, but like a really negative sacred violence, almost like a Satanism violence or something that completely changes their course of action. Or you have all of these religious practices of saying, what are we going to name this child? And it's like a long process. And you say, okay, this child will be named, um, you know, Jesus. Or, you know, the angel even comes and be like, this is Jesus. Or like a long, like very important name. Like uh, I, you can come up with something, river or something. You decide to name the child river. Why? Well, because the river is the source of life for the village. And this child, you know, the elders have gotten together and decided that this child has some sort of, is going to be a leader in the village. Therefore, part of its heart, right? That's like a sacred violence, right? So you have kind of arbitrary hunting. Then you have just malicious, cruel killing violence. And then you have sacred violence. Okay, so random John, Hitler as name, and then River as name, right? And all of those is a similar kind of arbitrary act. And yet it's not arbitrary once you do it. Likewise, it's kind of arbitrary to say your love with your spouse is different from your friends because you can't identify the distinction in the quality or the quantity. And yet once you commit to that distinction, like it's real. The distinction emerges. It's there in how you hold yourself and carry yourself in the world. And maybe you're deluded in that. Maybe you're wrong in that. Maybe you could calculate it and not find it and therefore have a reason to think it's crazy to think there's a distinction, but it's like there in a very strange way. And I, I, I do think naming is helpful here because naming is, al is basically always a commitment. Like when somebody is named something, they tend to keep that name. Very, very, very rarely do people change their name. Now the kid named Hitler may change their name, uh, but names tend to be the same kind of, I want to like radical, radical commitment because it's so kind of arbitrary. And yet because you make the commitment, it stops being arbitrary. It's the bothness again. It's this weird A-B-ness. The commitment makes it not arbitrary and it has causal impact. And that makes me think then, and then I'll pass it to whoever wants to speak. It's almost like meaning can only arise if something absurd happened. Like you have to do something absurd. There's like something absurd, something crazy, something arbitrary that then makes it not arbitrary, some sort of commitment to something and you don't know what's going to happen, but because you commit to that thing, you don't know what's going to happen, meaning then arises. And then also courage arises because you put yourself in experiences that require courage and that changes you. So there's something about this, this arbitrary act that the very commitment to it then makes it not arbitrary. Seems to be risky, very risky, um, it seems to be violence and therefore risk being an arbitrary violence as opposed to a sacred violence. And yet it's like the difference between life and death. It like has a big impact on life and what life is to you and how life unfolds. So I think thinking about this is very, and I'll give it to whoever wants to speak. It is very interesting to think about all this in the context of naming a child. That's a very interesting way to frame it because it seems like that's getting at it. And, it's, and, it, and that's so deep as opposed to just naming a cat a cat. That feels like more fluffy. But when you talk about this in terms of naming a child, that seems to be the correct metaphoric depth for what's going on. So that's really good. You know, I'll just sort of maybe say the last thing and then say bye to you both. You know, I go to the early morning class tomorrow morning, actually. So. You're a good soul. Good soul. <laughs> yeah. So, um, the, the, you know, the... In fact, if you think about it, I think Walter Benjamin has a very, very nice essay on language as such, where he sort of argues that naming is at the heart of language in, in some sense. Mm. That you know, um, it's interesting that you you can name animals, uh, but animals, uh, I, 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 you know, it, it's interesting. How, can animals name each other in that sense? And you know, Walter Benjamin has a uh, great, you know, it's so a my dog can recognize me calling it by a certain name. But it can't name another dog in that in that sense. There's something about um, naming which is which, which is very integral to our relationship to to to, to that point of gap or unconscious or whatever you want to know uh, real in that sense. Uh, that it's only when when unconscious gets articulated in this in this in this human form that that something like naming can arise because uh, 
for human beings, uh, uh, there is there is no way to work through that gap without actually finding this 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 technique of naming. In fact, in fact, naming is a form of technology in that sense. It's a form of technique. It's a form of uh, you know, uh, it, it's a form of technique, which is at the heart of which is why we call language itself a form of technique in that sense, in a set of techniques. Uh, because uh, naming allows you to hold a certain relationship with that with that gap. And naming can also cover that gap, you know, in that sense. And that, that, that is where you can find the relationship between language and violence. Because violence lies at the heart of this engagement with that gap. The challenge actually is that can we find a relationship with that violence which can move towards meaning, move towards this affirmation, or of you know because violence itself comes into comes into picture at a point where other forms of relationship with that gap are not possible in that sense. You know, violence is that very minimal level of an engagement with uh, with, with 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 our being in that sense, uh, where other forms of engagements are not you know in that. Uh, you know, so it is. It is a. It is a radical point of departure from our ability to use uh, language. So it, it it also form functions where language fails violence, which is exactly not true. But that is how the structure. You know, structurally that 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 that, that happens where I can't find a way to communicate something to you, and we both can't function together. It's there that I would need this violence too, and vice versa, where this violence fails. That I would like need need to use language back again. So once the violence, you know, that's what Hegel's self conscious master, master slave dialectic sort of, you know, starts with and, and starts to think about. So when you start thinking about that violence and how does that violent violence actually starts going back towards meaning, back towards this, this affirmation of the other, you know, I think I think at the heart of that movement lies our ability to use language in a particular way. Our ability to channelize language in a particular way, and that is where I think the question of sacred violence comes into picture. Because sacred violence is not sacred without its associated language, without its associated sacred acts in that sense. And I think um, that that becomes the interesting. Yeah, wonderful. It's been uh, it's been such a pleasure to dialogue with you today, Chitan. Um, Oh yeah, this is really going. This is causing me to reconsider the meaning of violence, or at least to much more playfully expand what that might mean. And you know, I spoke earlier about recording that solo video for the first time in a long time, and I'm starting just as I'm listening along, I'm feeling like the this this sense of the violence of meaning, very evocative idea for me, which is that by taking the risk to to speak to distinguish to express what i feel is in distinction to not expressing anything at all that that is a kind of violence because it's imbued with the will just as much as if i took an axe and chopped to a tree i'm expressing the words and then for the person who receives or witnesses those there's a forcefulness to it even if it's not being expressed with aggression and you can also see in like really good rap music, like a really good Kendrick Lamar, like people would describe like a good rap. There's, you know, there's like violence associated with it, even if it's not like a hit piece or calling out another rapper or whatever, just like when the flow is that intense and that much intensity is being imbued into the language, when it's expressing the inner truth of that person and it's fully fledged risking it, then it's like, you know, oh fuck, that's like <laughs> that's cut through. <laughs> I okay, have a further thought to add at that point. That's... Yeah, I, I just think no, and that's you know, if you think about it, violence actually is in some sense the shortest route. You know, it, it's when you when you collapse yourself to the smallest uh, possible. You know, in in that sense. Uh, because human beings need uh, need need this minimum of question in the, to engage and find a survival with, with, with that environment because um, there need to be some way to do things when all other ways fail. That is how species can. Uh, but to reduce yourself to that minimal, uh, and that is what I think modern modernity is all about. That in modernity we are not afraid to exploit that that minimal uh, shortest route. You know, uh, such that as long as the form of it is not 
gory and violent and bloody and stuff we don't mind exploiting the shortest truth because for us it is it, what is what is become important is to simply get that ends you know everybody should get food everybody should you know but i think it, it is no longer important to what path we are taking to each step and it is minimum minute uh, it is not important what path you're taking to reach to be entering this this realm of violence which is why if you think about all ideas of non violence non violence is not a question of elimination of violence in fact elimination of violence is a violence is is a very unhealthy you know non violence is a particular mode of engagement with violence in that sense a particular way of holding violence particular way of caring for it particular way of you know um, finding a certain kind of you know healthy uh, relationship to it you know which comes from a certain element of care certain element, element of uh, sensitivity towards violence and so on and so forth um, you know which which means that you're mm -hmm. not collapsing everything to its minimal shortest possible route in that sense would you guys say then that something like Martin Luther King's, uh, I've been to the mountaintop speech, right? He's a nonviolent activist, but he's got this absolute intensity that cuts through. Is that in this like very playful expansion? Like I, I don't really know where we, where we are with it, but this playful expansion of what violence could mean. Is that a kind of sacred violence of speech that he's exercising in that? This is really interesting. So um, there's something about violence that is distinction, cut, break apart. So there, violence as being described here, which I think is very important. And I think it, it, there's some sort of secret in the fact that so many religions integrated violence. And it's almost like you have to go through violence to relate. And if you ignore violence, you don't relate. Either because you're overly identified and you're just part of kind of the mass. Or if you don't relate healthy to violence, you end up in a mob. And I like to talk about the difference between mob and mass because I don't think they're the same. Like the mass is kind of hot and ardent, banality of evil, everydayness, Nazi Germany, where the mob is more like uh, the French Revolution. Okay, and they're not the same, right? So if you don't get a healthy relation to violence, you either don't have violence and you kind of get mixed into the mass and you don't break yourself out of the mass and you're just lockstep with the mass or the violence integrates in a kind of mob that tears everything down. And I think it's really important to, again, see that society has to navigate between those, the mob and the mass. And I think we've actually gotten in trouble where we've named all collectives as identically a mob and they have the same character because the motivations and reasons behind various collective violences are not the same. They, they historically can vary. I think it's very important. So there's something about violence that is distinction. Um, something about cutting, like when, like when Lamar is speaking in Pimp the Butterfly, it's like, oh, you got the social order. I'm going to break it apart and force you to look at it. Like when it's kind of this invisible working doorknob, like in Heidegger, you don't look at the society, so you don't see the injustices. So I'm going to come along and force you to see it. And the violence, so the violence is tied to seeing. There's something about the violence that makes you see, okay? Because before it was a mass or something. And you couldn't see it because there was no definition and there was no distinction. So this kind of this kind of sacred violence that we're describing is in service of sight. So if we go back to what we we're saying, so there's arbitrary naming, which I associated with John, which doesn't really serve sight because John just kind of fades into the mass. But then there's this kind of demonic naming where we say Hitler, and that's problematic because you're breaking it apart, not for sight, but almost the end seeing because you're destroying the social order and it's kind of a holocaust, it's, an, it's uh, destroying everything, so there's nothing to see. But then there's a kind of sacred violence that is breaking apart or bringing out so that you see something and then can give it the kind of Simone Weil attention or you see it in the right way in of itself and how it harmonizes with everything else as opposed to become invisible in everything else, right? And so when Martin Luther says, I've been to the mountaintop, one, he's standing outside the mass. I've gone to the mountain. Not everyone has gone to the mountain. I've gone to a place where I can see what actually is the case outside of the mass of the social order or the mobs that are attacking us in Mrs., you know, in, in Alabama that are attacking us as we fight injustice. So I've seen beyond the mass in the mob. And I've also stuck myself out in such a manner uh, that would let me be seen as someone who's gone to the mountaintop because I, I act different. If you've been to the mountaintop, you act different than how everyone else acts and therefore are seen differently, right? So there's something about violence and seeing that is deeply tied together. And therefore, when we talk about risk, 
why is a risk a risk? Like the moment you say, I'm not going to do what everyone else is doing, you now can be seen. You stand out. There's a violence you do when you don't follow the social order to the social order. Because you now are kind of saying that doesn't have to be the way. You're saying the mass can be broken apart, like, like Lamar like hitting the society so you see the institutional problems. And by you taking a risk to take a different path, that then can lead to everyone looking back and seeing the society differently and seeing you differently because you stand out and you're not following the social order. Likewise, in nonviolence, what I think is so important with nonviolence is the key to that tactic is it causes existential reflection on the police officer that sicks the dog on you. Because if you have your dog and you sick it on this African-American who's not fighting back, you have to existentially see yourself as the kind of person who would attack someone who isn't attacking you. So you cannot rationalize it as self-defense. You are being purely violent and it is not provoked. It is purely your choice. So that requires you to existentially reflect on yourself. And when that existential reflection occurs, you change internally, not just externally, because you say, I don't want to be the kind of person that sticks dogs on people just because they can. I don't want to have to see myself as a bad person. So nonviolence causes you to see yourself differently, not want you to see yourself that way. And so you stop being a racist. So violence and nonviolence are tied to seeing and how things are seen. And risk makes you stand out so that you're seen and then makes the social order be seen differently. And basically, meaning has something to do with the violence of which generates sight. Meaning has something to do with the violence that generates sight and how you see yourself, how the social order sees you, how the social order sees itself. And in that imagery, in that seeing of which is a result of a violence that breaks across apart a mass to make distinction, but doesn't fall into the temptation of becoming a mob, then it's possible to have change because when th people see themselves in a certain way, they change who they are because they don't want to be that way. Or they see themselves and say, well, I'm making an arbitrary kind of absurd choice to pursue something that I can't see where it's going to end up before I know where it's going to end up. I have to see myself as the kind of person that would do that. Oh, I guess you have to see yourself as courageous. Oh, I guess you have to see yourself as someone who's willing to take risk. Oh, I guess you have to see yourself as an individual of whom isn't just blurred into an invisible mask. Well, now you have the possibility of meaning. Now you have the possibility of courage. Now you have the possibility of value. And so it would seem that the violence that we are describing is profoundly connected to the question of seeing and sight and how things are seen and understood and how that is what changes people and changes ourselves and changes how we situ situate ourselves in the world. It makes possible the seeing of a harmony in a dance that otherwise could not be seen. So in this way, the violence of which leads to sight leads to the possibility of seeing a harmony and then how we fit ourselves within that movement of the love that moves the sun and other stars, if we take that line from Dante. I'll just quickly, I think, I think Jijak has a very interesting quote that, you know, you're going to have to think about how how Gandhi is more violent than Hitler in that sense, and I think and that's where Daniel you're getting at, you know that 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 it's not it's not the violence, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, and I think I think Nietzsche gets it when he says that this idea of power that wants something is the lowest form of power. So when when Hitler is saying that Gandhi is more violent than Hitler, he's saying that Hitler is 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 accessing the lowest form of violence in that sense. You know, he doesn't understand what is violence, which is why you know Hitler says, "I know what is violence," which is why I don't want power. I know how to use it. <laughs> you know, I, I think there's something of the, uh, you know which we need to think about over over there. You know, if power is what wills in the will, as Nietzsche would say then power that immediately wants something the lowest form of that will in that sense. You know, if it's simply seeking to do, do tell you to do this, to do, do that, in, in, that, in that way. No, I, I think it's so critical. And then I'll, um, the African-American who doesn't fight back against the police officer forces the police officer to see himself as the kind of person who would attack someone who's not fight, fighting back. That's incredible power. Like power is the ability to change how a person sees themselves. Like, and that's why when we talk about like institutional power or zeitgeist or the norms of Foucault and all these different things, there's something there about affecting how people see. And what does language do? If I name a cat a cat, 
I see the phenomenon of cat as a cat, like the word, right? So there's a way because naming changes how you see things because it changes how you interpret them and how you think about them. And so, so the act of language as violence is impacted to how we see. Likewise, when the African-American doesn't fight back, it changes how the officer sees himself, right? And when we take a risk, we change how we see ourselves and how the society sees us. And it is in this changing of sight that meaning arises, but I don't think meaning can arise without this changing of sight because there's nothing distinguished enough to give meaning or to experience as meaning. And so you have to have the risk element because, and then therefore the sacred violence is tied to seeing. And then that makes sense with religions, right? Because you have these rituals where you focus on God, right? And you're like, oh, you're looking at your everyday all the time. You're just going through your everyday life. Well, we're gonna do this ritual now. Uh, either it'd be the naming of a child, which is the violence, or it could be the killing of an animal or all these different practices. And now you're going to look for it. You can even look at like going to church on a Sunday as a kind of violence because it's just disrupting your, uh, your week, right? You're being forced to pull yourself out of what you do in your everydayness and going to this particular practice. And that's where, again, I, you know, to be clear, so a lot of these religious practices or Viveki practices can be extremely good because it can kind of pull you out of your everydayness uh, to make you kind of look at your life differently. But the key is that that thing that you see has to lead to risk on a larger scale in your the rest of the week, right? If it only like that's what happened to a lot of Christians, right? They would they would take a risk on Sunday, but not a risk through the other days of the the week, right? And this is where Paul is then screaming, "Hey, after Jesus, the Sabbath is every day all the time, not just on Sunday." Mm -hmm. So you have to be like Jesus and be taking the risk of Jesus twenty four seven. And if you're not, that's a problem, right? It's not that Paul gets rid of the Sabbath. A lot of people say that. Um, what Paul actually does is expand the Sabbath to constantly at all times, which a way to look at that would be to expand the risk and the seeing of the world according to the Sabbath 24 seven, not just as a contained period. So the, the expansion of the Sabbath is, a, is an expansion of the practices and the seeing. And, and again, the violence that we are talking about changes how you see. The bad violence, like the arbitrary violence, does it's just hunting, it's just recreational, so it fits into the normal way you live. The demonic um, violence or naming of Hitler destroys society so you don't see anything because it's returned to the womb of uncreated night to still of sound and motion, as Milton talks about. And then there is the sacred violence that changes how you see in a manner that creates meaning, um, that changes how you carry yourself in the world, and I think that's important. Chitan, it's a pleasure, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes, thank you so much, Chitan. I seriously doubt my capacity to uh, to further embellish or add to the flow that you've been on for the last uh, period, Daniel, but I'm going to add a few little loose please, threads please. that are coming to me and maybe it will bring something. So, I mean, to begin with the end, this is also very radical. This sense that my going to church to pray could be a sort of violence and what is that violence directed against if not my the everyday self yes. that's not coming into contact with whatever I'm coming into contact with there? And then with the added implication that in order for that to really be violence, it has to be the kind of ritual practice that brings me to the edge space of like, oh, fuck, what am I, what, what might I do? What might be the consequence? Uh, genuinely transformative basically. Yep. And then, yeah, I, I just wanted to sort of bring us back down to the root metaphor again of the violence, because it was, as you were speaking about this violence as something that allows to see in the, in the sense of a metaphorical violence, right? The violence of great poetry. Um, but at the core, right? If you think about, you know, uh, two men, who are competing over a woman who get into a fight and the moment that that moves into like i'm gonna flip in go in and i'm gonna and it's a showing right like the moment that it moves from just the exchange it's like i'm going to show my passion it's what's going to be seen even though you know this is <laughs> not properly modern in any sense right but the, what the woman is going to see is the true passion of the man expressed in the violence towards the other man in that conflict. And so that 
just like returning to that understanding that like i mean and there's so much um horror and and darkness associated with all of this right like the the abusive parent or whatever is like i'm gonna fucking show you when i get you with the belt right that's 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 not pretty but this is the this is what we're extrapolating up from it's like by the intensity of passion shown right this is going to i'm going to show you you will you it won't be i won't have to convey it to you by any other means except by virtue of fully taking the risk and expressing whatever is expressed it will have a self-evident quality to it and this is this is where it's at for me right now in terms of my own art making and i've always felt I felt more and more over the years that there was something about surpassing expectations of what was expected that I might do. And I've known that for a long time, and it hasn't felt like a self-centered kind of thing. It hasn't felt like, oh, this is about the, the affirmation of my ego, but it's only in this conversation I've understood why is that so rewarding? Why is it so rewarding to feel that? It's because... I am actually, it's an outward movement. If I can do that, if I can act in such a way that surpasses the expectations, I am doing violence to the self expectations of everybody else, particularly the people who know me. Others, you know, of course, you know, Jordan Peterson has impact on people who never met him. That happens too. But I think it's really acute when it's the the people you went to high school with, the people you've known in all these different contexts, because they have a mapping of you. And when you break out of that mapping, right, that's not just something that's, ha your transformation hasn't just happened for you. It has occurred inside of everybody who knows you, who now has to either uh, become disconnected from the reality of who you are, or, you know, have some sort of projection that covers over it, or they have to update, they have to renew their map of one part, one point of their reality has now shifted. And in a world where so many people are in the locomotion, and this is what's so flipping suffocating for me, or, or a depressive about being back in hometown in, in England is there's something in the field that it's just like nothing ever changes <laughs> kind of thing. And so it's that little pinprick that makes the difference. And that's you, violent. You, you, you just said a bunch <laughs> of really, really important things. Um, one, um, basically, if you never face in your life that acute pain that you were describing, you cannot have meaning. Um, and all meaning making practices must be in service of your ability to face that acute pain and handle it. And that's ultimately what has to occur. And that's why meaning requires courage and it wa requires a kind of violence and it requires a certain kind of standing out. Very interestingly, you know, I always talk about David Hume. David Hume, one of the reasons for David Hume, you must return to your common life is precisely to face that acute pain. Like you start in common life, but you have to leave to individuate and go on the philosophical journey. But if you never come back, you never face the acute pain. And so the philosophy becomes an escapism and it never generates meaning. It never does the transformativeness that it must do. You must return to the place of facing the acute pain. It's one thing to individuate and do your own thing when it doesn't cost you anything. But guess what? It feels meaningless because there's no violence. You're just you're actually in the mass of people who are just doing neoliberalism. So if you stay in your common life, you're just in the mass of your common life. But if you go to neoliberalism and you're always leaving home and doing the next thing, the next great thing, career, whatever, you could be in the mass of neoliberalism if you grant me that term. But when you return home, oh, it's acute because you're that pinprick. You're that difference. That radically transforms you as a subject and creates meaning and changes how you see the world because you have to suffer how people see you changing. And that is very difficult. And that is what is required for the meaning and required for people to overcome the nihilism that is being described. You do not overcome the nihilism because you can fill out a worksheet where that asks, what's the meaning of your life? And you say to help people. That's not overcoming nihilism because that's just answering a, a, a freaking quiz question. Overcoming nihilism is the ability to face that acute pain that forces you to stand for who you are and what you believe in. You're not committing. Here's the thing. 
That taking a stand, as I just described, is a form of nonviolence in the Martin Luther King sense. Every single part, basically nonviolence in that sense is the only road to meaning. Like that changing how people see, like that kind of work where you're standing because, but that's the only way. But that requires you to face the acute pain of other people being like, what the heck are you doing? Who are you? And you yourself to look at yourself and go, who the heck am I? Uh, because that nonviolence, quote unquote, that I just said, it changes how you see yourself. What's so important is all the religions basically were like, we have to figure out how to contain violence so that it doesn't spill over and destroy everything. So they actually created rituals of violence at a certain time with, say, animals or whatever, precisely so you don't have the two men fighting. Because what they understood is that if you don't have those practices of violence, in, then what ends up happening is violence is manifest in a showing, which means it's linear. Here's the funny thing. The power of violence is lost precisely when it is, is it expressed because then it becomes linear and singular. When you keep violence inside, it's dynamic and it changes you and makes you take a stand and take on courage. Dynamic internal violence is Nietzsche's will per se. When, when you punch a guy in the face, yeah, that's showing that you care, but the danger now is you've unleashed the power and it becomes incredibly destructive, right? It's like they say in good storytelling, you're supposed to not make it direct, Good poems are what? Indirect. And yet in that indirectness, they become way more powerful and way more direct about the whole of life. The indirectness of poems make it more direct about the whole of life. When poetry is too direct, it's direct about a single thing and then it misses out on everything else. Right. So when you punch a guy in the face for a girl, yeah, that form, you're very direct to that manifestation of your care. But you leave out the all the other dimensions of the care for that woman in that act. And therefore, the love is impoverished because you transform the violence to something linear as opposed to something dynamic. That then would be Nietzsche's will that would then change how you carry yourself in the society by keeping the violence internal to yourself. It's more dynamic and it's actually more powerful and it's more capable of having you break through from the mass of society, from standing out from the relationships and therefore making you take a stand for a real choice that forces you to face your fears. And in facing those fears, you can be made perfect in love. And so by having that dynamic violence be something that works on you, which requires you to not fall into the temptation of using violence on others, therefore you're engaging in nonviolence, that leads to an existential transformation in yourself because you change how you see yourself in the way that Martin Luther King does. It, it forces you, though, to face how other people see you and their change of seeing you, which is hard, but precisely because you rise to the occasion of facing all of that, it is now possible to have a life that is based on a radical choice of saying, yes, I believe that my life means this. And I really must believe it because I paid a high price for it. So there's darn good reason to think that it's legitimate and real. And this is the point that I will make that stand. And that can be today if one can only choose to make that commitment. It's a pleasure, Jacob. Uh, always a pleasure. I, I enjoyed you. it very much. Thank you, Jacob. Oh, my goodness. I've enjoyed incredible, it. Incredible dialogue, incredible energy, incredible flow. So happy I chose to come to the net today. I'm glad you came as well, Jacob. It's always a pleasure to see you, sir.